Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is A Short History of Protest in Medieval Ireland. In the podcasts in the last few months, we have been following Strongbow and the Norman invasion of Ireland. But today we are going to look at the fascinating but often forgotten world of protests such as riots, politically motivated murders and at times mob justice in medieval Ireland. When we think of the Middle Ages, the first thing that springs to mind are kings, queens, lords and ladies. However, they only represent a tiny fraction of the population. By looking at protests, we will get a glimpse as to how the other half, or rather, the other 99% of medieval society lived. Surprisingly enough, when we look at protest, we will see that while at times it can appear Everything has changed in the last seven or eight centuries. Some things have stayed the same. Things that irk people today, taxation, war and wages, were the cause of protests in the Middle Ages as well. While our ancestors engaged in more forthright demonstrations than we might expect today, we will begin on a more familiar ground. A demonstration against a water tax in Dublin in 1244. In recent months, the Irish government's attempts to introduce a water tax has seen a major backlash with protests springing up across the country. This is by no means the first time taxation has been a controversial subject in Ireland. As early as the 12th century, there is evidence that taxation caused consternation among the population. In 1188, not long after the Norman invasion, what was known as the Salahadeen tax was imposed on the Norman colony in Ireland. This hated tax was named after the Muslim leader Salahadeen and was a 10% levy on all revenues and goods collected to fund a crusade by Henry II. While over £100,000 was collected across Ireland, England, Wales and France, Henry II died before he could take the cross but his son Richard the Lionheart gained infamy or fame, depending on your worldview, by playing a prominent role in what has since become known as the Third Crusade. While the Saladin tax was begrudgingly paid, the earliest sign the tax provoked outright protest and resistance was unsurprisingly an attempt by the Crown to impose a water tax on Dublin in 1244. Dublin's water supply in the Middle Ages was notorious. Archaeological excavations have revealed that water inside the medieval walls was contaminated as some of the town's cesspits were dug too close to the wells and would have contaminated the water. In 1244, plans were drawn up to pipe water from the nearby River Liffey into the town. The King's representative in Ireland, the just this year, Morris Fitzgerald, instructed the Sheriff of Dublin without delay by twelve free and lawful men of his county of Dublin to make inquisition as to whence water can be best and most conveniently taken from its course and conducted to the king's city of Dublin, for the benefit of the city and at the cost of the citizens who have undertaken to pay the amount. While no doubt all were happy to have water piped into the city, which can only have been an improvement on the contaminated wells, the issue of who should pay was more contentious. Given they already paid the Crown a yearly fee for their privilege of living in Dublin, it seems at least some of the population of the town were reticent to pay, as the authorities expected resistance. The Justice Year continued in his decree. Any who oppose are to be suppressed by force and attached to appear before the Justice Year at the next assay. Those who resist are to be arrested and held to further mandate. While water and taxation has long vexed Dubliners, the subject of pay has also been a bone of contention in Ireland since the Middle Ages. Unlike the modern world, throughout the medieval period, most people did not live or work in towns. The vast majority of the population lived in rural areas, most being what we know as peasants. Peasants in the Middle Ages were a wide and varied bunch, ranging from the very poor, who struggled to rent a cottage to live in, to much more prosperous people who rented large tracts of land. The poor survived in part by labouring on their neighbours' farms at busy times of the year. 
while through much of the Middle Ages payment was in kind. Through goods, rather than money, in the 13th century money payment was introduced. However, medieval pay rates left a lot to be desired. A male labourer received two pence per day, while women received even less, only one pence per day. These rates, either in kind or in money, rarely ever changed. They were bound by time-honoured custom and laws, which limited the peasants' movement so they couldn't simply walk away and find more lucrative employment. However, through the final years of the 13th century, Ireland was rocked by a severe crisis and the customs and laws that bound payment came under severe pressure. Between 1295 and 1297, Ireland endured famine, while much of the island was devastated by a war between the Burke and Fitzgerald families. However, by 1299, circumstances were improving. A peace of sorts was agreed between the warring factions, while a dramatic improvement in the weather resulted in a bumper growing season and harvest. Having endured years of war and starvation, the peasantry, usually no more than a footnote in history books, now found themselves in an unusually powerful position. While the famine of 1295 had reduced their numbers, the prolific harvest of 1299 saw the demand for their labour increased. This resulted in a labour shortage, presenting the peasants with an unusual opportunity. As the demand for their labour increased, they launched the first recorded strike in Ireland, demanding better payment. In May 1299, a parliament, then largely made up of landowning nobles, heard that on account of the fertility of the present year, servants, ploughmen, carters, treasures refuse to serve. It is agreed and provided that such servants should serve as they were accustomed and should stay with their lords with whom they have stayed before and receive the liveries and wages as in other years they were accustomed. Prison was threatened on the labourers who defied the law while landowners who dared to pay higher wages or lure peasants away from their lords were threatened with steep fines. It seems this early attempt by the poor to break free from the chains of feudal life did not end well for the peasants. Quite ominously, we hear nothing more about this strike. Through the later medieval period, Warfare became an increasingly common feature in daily life. Like today, these wars produced protests, but the reasons for the protests against war in the late medieval period were very different from their modern counterparts. Few, if any, had a problem with war per se. They were more concerned with the massive burdens these conflicts placed on the wider population. In Ireland, war began to take a toll on daily life after Edward I, the King of England and Ireland, went to war with Scotland in 1296. This war saw Ireland used as a source of men and material which began to bleed the Norman colony on the island white in the early years of the 14th century. Indeed, it contributed to the fact that the Exchequer in Ireland was bankrupt by 1315. Of the many hardships war inflicted though, it was the constant movement of troops which provoked violent flashpoints. As Ireland was put on a war footing in the early 14th century, troops were frequently on the move, even moving in times of peace, causing mayhem where they went. As early as 1297, a parliament enacted legislation which stated, The community of this land has hitherto been aggrieved by armies which magnates lead without warrant through the middle of the land of peace and the marches where there is no war. You can only imagine the chaos which followed when hundreds of armed men turned up at the town. This unsurprisingly resulted in frequent violent protests. A full-scale riot broke out in Drogheda in 1305 when the townspeople successfully stopped the soldiers of Lord Piers de Birmingham entering their town, an incident which saw several soldiers killed. The same year when the noble Morris de Carew camped near the walls of medieval Dublin with a small army, he and his soldiers were attacked by several prominent Dubliners, including two future mayors. This attack also saw several of his troops killed. The movement of troops wasn't the only grievance war caused in medieval Dublin. Royal officials purchasing foodstuffs for the king's armies 
frequently turned up at Irish market towns buying foodstuffs while often paying below market rates with nothing more than an IOU promising cash in the future. Merchants despised these officials known as purveyors as they frequently left them out of pocket. When purveyors turned up at Dublin in 1304, major protests broke out in the town led by the mayor Geoffrey de Morton. The town's market was euphemistically described by officials as greatly disturbed which resulted in Morton being thrown in jail and Dublin losing its right to govern itself for a few months. Raucous and all as these protests were, they were surpassed in 1310 when the bakers of Dublin learned the hard way the dangers of ripping off medieval Dubliners. As the 13th century was drawing to a close, the weather in Ireland became increasingly wet in a climactic shift yet to be properly understood by historians. While today we fail to notice the impacts of a particularly cold or wet winter, in the medieval period these had an immediate, direct and disastrous consequence. Bad weather produced very poor harvests and the resulting shortages, particularly in grains, saw the price of bread skyrocket. A sharp increase in bread, the staple of many in medieval Ireland, meant starvation and famine. This exact scenario unfolded in Ireland between 1308 and 1310, and by 1310 the island was entering what was a third year of dire shortages. While many struggled to survive, Dublin's bakers couldn't resist profiteering on the misery of the starving population. After a few years of poor harvests, flour, the key ingredient in bread, had become increasingly valuable and the bakers began to maximise their profits by mixing the flour with cheaper ingredients, producing inferior quality bread. However, the miserly bakers were caught in the act. You can only imagine the anger among the starving population when they discovered that, as they tried to survive, they were eating what was poor quality bread made to enrich the bakers of the town. Now, if this happened today, you would go to some food or health authority. However, in 1310, the reaction was somewhat more violent and immediate. The annals of St Mary's Abbey in Dublin recalled how the bakers suffered a new kind of torment which had never been seen before. They were strapped to the tails of horses and hauled along the hurdles, the wooden meshes that lined the streets. What a deeply humiliating experience. This would also have been an incredibly painful exercise, with their legs and backs torn on the meshes. While this no doubt ensured the quality of Dublin's bread in years to come, the issue that caused the greatest upheaval and protest in medieval Ireland was tensions between the merchant-dominated towns and the nobility. We have already seen the tension wrought in Ireland by the increase in warfare in the late 13th century. This was intimately linked to another source of protest, the increasing tensions between the nobility and the populations of medieval towns. While armies on the move were causing trouble, the nobles leading them increasingly became a law unto themselves. A parliament in 1310 noted that inflation in Ireland was dramatically increasing because, and to quote, the principal cause why all things saleable are often increased in price are because that merchants and others passing through the country are robbed of their goods by those of great lineage without making reasonable payment. This naturally raised the temperature between the merchant-dominated towns and the powerful nobles. But there are also more fundamental differences between the two. In the 14th century, some towns offered freedom to serfs. For example, in Dublin, a law offered protection to serfs who had left their lords in the words, serfs who by the permission of the mayor and commonality remain in the city of Dublin for a year and a day are thereby freed of all claims of their former lords. Naturally, a town offering such protection infuriated the nobility. These rising tensions between urban populations and the nobles reached fever pitch in February 1317 when Dublin faced siege from an invading Scots army. Facing a potential life and death situation if the city fell, the population, led by the mayor, seized Richard Burke, the Earl of Ulster, the most powerful noble in Ireland, then staying in the town. 
Distrust had reached the point that Dubliners believed Burke might betray the city to the approaching Scottish army. In the process of seizing Burke, the mob of Dubliners killed seven of the Earl's retinue and partially burned St Mary's Abbey where he was staying. After his capture, he was imprisoned in Dublin Castle for several months. Even after Burke was released by order of the King in May 1317, tensions rumbled on. Indeed, the King, Edward II, had to take extraordinary measures which saw Parliament, then in effect a gathering of nobles, banned from meeting at Dublin. He also prohibited nobles from taking up residence in the town. The reasons he cited was that if nobles entered Dublin, what he calls dangers might ensue. These stories are just some of the surviving examples of what is a fascinating but forgotten history of protest from medieval Ireland. In the next show, I will be returning to the story of the Norman invasion. This will be out in two weeks' time. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>